Welcome to the show. I'm Danella, and here's what's happening now. Drake surpasses the Beatles. The Senate gets passive aggressive, but in a political way. And why is adulting so hard? Seriously, we'll talk about it in just a moment. But first, go Drake. They said it wasn't possible, but Drake did it. He demolished a 54-year-old record set by the Beatles. His new album, Scorpion, is in Billboard Top 100 charts. Seven songs from the Scorpion are in the top 10. That crushes a record set by the Beatles on April 4th, 1964. They had the first five spots on the top 100 with Can't Buy Me Love, Twist and Shout, She Loves You, I Wanna Hold Your Hand, and Please Please Me. Now, no other act in history has ever done this, but Drake has. Demolished the Beatles' top five records with seven. In addition, Scorpion shatters a global record with 1 billion streams. Never been done before. We're talking 1 billion streams in its first week. And it also debuted as number one on Billboard's 200 album charts. That's amazing. And everybody's doing the Drake challenge, dancing, doing heart moves. Congratulations, Drake. Also, congratulations to everyone that was involved in this successful rescue of the soccer team, the young soccer team. I think the youngest member was 11 years old, but the soccer team that was stuck in the cave in Thailand, along with their coach. Now, here's some of the details that's coming out. Um, I don't know if you were following this or watching this at all, but it was harrowing. In fact, a former Thailand Navy SEAL died. Oh, they had to swim through uh, uh, miles of cave and small tight quarters. That has to be so scary. So reports are coming out saying that they actually had to sedate the boys. And these reports vary between some saying lightly, loosely sedated to completely sedated in order to get them out. But so many people came together. I know Elon Musk sent people over as well. I believe it was 30 uh, Navy SEALs from the U.S., but uh, all over the world, people came together to create a rescue plan led by the Thailand government, and they were able to get each child out safely. And here's what they're saying about the coach. They say that the coach was a lifesaver to the boys, not only teaching them to ration the food that they had. Thank God uh, they were out previously before somehow ending up in the cave celebrating one of the boy's birthday. And they were saying that they had bought so much food to celebrate this birthday. Well, that was the food that they had to ration. We're talking, I believe, 10 days. Well, the coach apparently spent some time as a monk and was teaching the boys meditation. Oh, amazing story. The fact, I mean, you got to think about it. These boys are in total darkness, young, total darkness for so many days. And they also said that earlier in the week, so let's say day one and two. So the earlier part of them being stuck, the coach had them eat protein bars and then, you know, a little less food later. And so they said this probably helped them because they packed on more calories and then tapered off. So kudos to this coach, although there is some speculation about why were the boys in the cave. And so they're still trying to figure this all out. But as you can imagine, the boys are very weak and they want to make sure that they get strong, they ward off infection and become healthy. And so as time progresses, more information will come out. But it's that was a harrowing story. But thankfully, everyone's out and they're alive. And this shows what can happen when we all work together. I swear this world is so dividing, uh, divisive and isolating. And really this shows what can happen when we all work together. Also in the news this week, Papa John's, the face, the owner of Papa John's, you know, the, yeah, that guy. So 
I don't even know. First of all, how are we just now finding out about this? So he's on a conference call about sensitivity training, right? (laughs) And so here's what he reportedly said in the call. Colonel Sanders called black people, you know, the N word. And he was complaining that Sanders never received backlash. They're also saying that he made reference to growing up in Indiana, where he said people used to drag black people from their trucks until they died. Yeah, and this is all in a uh, sensitivity training. What? So then he apologizes for this conference call that occurred in May. We're hearing about it now. And then he has to step down, obviously, right? So he announces he's stepping down. Okay. So I don't follow football, but I know people who watch it and follow it. And I follow people who follow it. And so some are saying how interesting this is that this is happening right before the football season, right? Why are we just now finding out about it? That the corporation is really covering their butt. Like they knew this occurred and, you know, going to fire him. I don't know. I don't really get the whole thing, but I'd want to pose it to you and say, are you no longer eating Papa John's? If you've ever eaten Papa John's, I have, I used to like, I mean, the extra disgusting butter. I mean, I say it's disgusting because why are we pouring butter on your pizza? But I used to like it, you know, and even the little jalapeno they would give you. Um, I didn't eat it often, but you know, if I were going to eat some pizza, I liked Papa John's. And so, right. Are you not going to eat Papa John's? And this is what people say a lot of times, you know, when we discover racist CEOs and business owners, you know, of, of companies that we love. We are consumers, but are you not going to consume Papa John's? I am curious because I hear people argue the idea of nothing will stop me from buying the products that I like. I know that sounds ridiculous. And we, when I say it out loud, right, you think whoever would say that is crazy, but think about it. You hear so many corporations actually do racist things. And then all of a sudden you might find yourself back, you know, purchasing something from them. So I'm really curious. Are you giving up Papa John's? Speaking of Papa John's and some racists, let's head over to Starbucks where they have said something amazing. They are planning to give up straws. And we're talking about all of their Starbucks. They're saying they're getting rid of straws by 2020. So here's the whole huff and puff about straws. I don't know if you know this, but you know, really, if you think about it, you have this little piece of plastic only for one time. It's a one-time use. And there's so much plastic littering our oceans and you see birds as well as fish dying because of plastic and specifically straws. And so Starbucks is saying, hey, let us do our part. So what they're doing is they're creating strawless lids and straws we made out of paper and recyclable plastic. And here's why this is a really big deal. So the organization called for Strawless Ocean says Americans use 500 million plastic straws each day, a majority of which end up in the ocean. And they estimate that plastic in the ocean will surpass that of marine life by 2050. Could you imagine more plastic in the ocean than fish in the sea? The UK announced a full phase out of straws and cotton swabs in April. On July 1st, Seattle became the first city to ban plastic straws. So the idea is, yes, plastic isn't the biggest problem in the ocean, but it is one that we can easily eliminate. Have you ever used the metal straw before? Because I know some, you know, restaurants and bars and lounges, they give you metal straws um, or you can buy them for your home. So one of the reasons I don't like metal is like when you touch it, it's so cold on your lips, it feels kind of odd. But also I think, how can I properly clean this, right? So that, and then I've used paper, but then after a while, you know how you're so used to chewing? I know, first world problems. I can't use paper straws. Just saying, just takes getting used to. Obviously, please, we're using straws because we're used to them. But um, I know they're making the paper ones stronger And so people will use them and they will last a little bit longer. But it's really interesting when you think about these little things you can do. And I I, I say this, I say all the time, imagine how terrible it really must be in our world if you see the actual government making changes, 
Right. If the government is saying, like, for example, in Kenya, no plastic is allowed there. So heads up, if you travel anytime soon there, do not bring little plastic plastic baggies in your luggage. If you do, they will fine you. When you arrive, you will pay an additional fine. But um, overall, that's an amazing thing to encourage less plastic use in order to save our oceans. Because really, when we're thinking about it, that's like definitely our children within our children's life lifetime and then their children I can't imagine how bad it would be unless we do this and so now environmentalists and people that follow this sort of thing are really looking at McDonald's saying hey will you take the lead on this as well will you become strawless and do what you can uh, to eliminate straws so only time will tell And now we'll head up to Flint, Michigan, where Elon Musk says that he's going to fix the water supply to homes in Flint, Michigan. Here's what he said. He promised this on Twitter. He says, please consider this a commitment that I will fund fixing the water in any house in Flint that has water contamination above FDA levels. No kidding. I hope that he is not kidding. That will be amazing. That will be such a blessing. Lead so damaging to your body can kill you over time. And to think that people are still battling this in Flint, Michigan. It's terrible. And I love to see, I mean, I know corporations at the end of the day, we don't know what goes on, how cutthroat it is, but I really love to see people that are not only in the limelight as far as public figures, celebrities, entertainers, but also business owners that see problems in the world and think this is an easy fix. You know, I have all of these resources. This is an easy fix for me. I remember back following Katrina, I, a year later, went there and did a report. This was for BET, and there was a, an area, an entire community that was funded by Brad Pitt. I believe at that time he was filming a movie and really fell in love with New Orleans. And we know, if you're a Brad Pitt fan, that he had a home there, lived there as well for for years. But at that point, I think um, I wasn't really following where he lived back then. But I remember it was a new movie he was working on, fell in love with the, the city and wanted to do something. And so he built these amazing houses and they were on stilts. And I went and I was, you know, talking to some of the families that lived there. And literally it was, you know, just sign up and you can, you know, first come, I guess, or a lottery and you just get in. And it was amazing. Not only were the houses elevated because the thought process is, you know, it's going to happen. Flooding's going to happen there again. So the houses were on stilts elevated, but in addition, they had solar panels. They also collected rainwater. And so they were cheaper for the residents to live in. And I remember just thinking, go Brad Pitt. Like, oh, that is amazing for you to do something like this to say hey this is an easy fix for me I can build at least this many houses and let me see how many more people I can get to invest in this and we can make a community and help people live here longer because if you notice after Katrina a lot of the houses that were uh, just demolished and even housing projects they got rebuilt but their residents couldn't afford to live there terrible and so it's just nice to see in our world situations where people look at problems that for them could be easily fixed by just placing a phone call or spending money there's multiple ways to solve problems Uh, a good friend of mine taught me this a while ago I never thought about it in this way but it's true you can solve problems multiple ways you could just throw money at it right you can pay your way out of it Um, or you know you could donate time donate energy to help solve it donate love to help solve it and so it's nice to see uh, for some people who can't throw time in to try to help solve it you know put their money put their resource in it to make a difference 
And back to Brad, heads up, when I spoke into some of the homeowners and many of the people I spoke to were first time homeowners and they were like, I just can't believe this opportunity, but they knew him because he was working on the houses himself. They said, oh yeah, you know, we saw him here. He would come and, and help fix up the houses. Him and some, some friends build these houses. Amazing. So I'd like to see more of that in the world. And now it's time for Political Pop. Here is your Political Pop for Friday, July 13th. So this week, the Senate got passive aggressive and they voted on something that can never really be upheld. But to the rest of the world, it says, I don't know what that guy's doing, but we trying to do something else. And here's what happened. So the vote was 88 to 11, saying that there should be a role for Congress when it comes to tariffs. They don't want Trump to be able to just continue on this trade war. What they would like is for Trump to seek approval from Congress first. So it's something that obviously will never happen. Like, you know, it's not, it's non-binding, but it really says a lot. Then this week he said he's going to hit China again with tariffs on $200 billion worth of products. And who says there's no trade war? This is really getting out of hand. I'm Danella Seelock, and that was your political pop. And now it's time for In Our World, and this week I'm posing the question, and it's this, why is adulting so hard? Um, uh, here's what got me to think, to ask you this question this week, here's why. So, I am hanging out with my nephew and his friends, and I'm talking to some young adults. We're talking uh, ages 20 to 23, you know, young and exciting life ahead of them. But literally, it seems like adulting is super hard. So just talking to them about their daily struggles, and man, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I don't wanna be like, you know, my parents or my grandparents when they're like, you know, when I was your age. But it's hard not to be that way when you hear just craziness. So one of his friends, and I'm telling you, he's an amazing friend, so sweet, so smart, so nice. So anyway, one of his friends was saying that uh, she had a desire to move to New York City. So we start talking about it, you know, and I'm telling her, yeah, you know, I lived in New York for nearly 10 years. It was great after college and then spent many years working there. It was awesome. So what's your plan? You know, when are you thinking about going? And so the more that we really like shaped out what her plan was or wasn't and what her current life was, I was just thinking to myself, man, adulting must be really hard. So anyway, so as we're talking, she's, she's thinking, you know, it's like my lifelong dream, you know, either there or Philadelphia. (laughs) So I know. (laughs) Just shaking my head because it's kind of like, okay. So, um, but just to to live in the city and see what it's like. And that's great. And I support everyone's dreams. And she's such a nice girl. But I started to worry for her thinking to myself, you realize this is like one of the most expensive cities in America and the world, right? One of, right? You realize that, um, you know how much a one bedroom apartment costs, you know, just talking to her about that. And she's like, you know, no way I'm telling her prices. And she's thinking I'm exaggerating. And the worst, like the saddest part of this is I'm telling her what prices was when I last lived in New York, which was 2009. And so here we are in 2018 and it's even more. So I ask her, are you saving now? You know, and we start talking about her home life and here's where the adulting, I'm thinking to myself, what the heck? So she was just talking about at home. And so she, I said, do you pay rent? And she's like, no, you know, I still live with my parents and oh my gosh, they're so stressful. If I stay out late, they want me to call them and they check my phone. I said, oh really? You know, they're probably just worried, you know, so do you have to pay them rent? And she's no, I don't have to pay them rent. I was like, oh, that's really nice. Yeah, but they make me clean the house. (laughs) And I was thinking, right, but you live for free? Do you buy groceries and all this stuff? She's saying, no, no, no. So I say, okay, so basically you're telling me this. You get to live in the house for free and you don't go to school, right? 
And all you have to do is clean up the house and you do work, but you get to keep all of your money. And she says, yes. And so I said, well, did you save up your money to move to New York? Well, no, I'm just thinking about it. So you don't have any savings, but you have this plan and you're frustrated that your parents make you clean up the house. <laughs> She's like, yes. And so here's what really hit me. She is first generation American. She was saying that her parents are actually, you know, not from America. And so I was talking to another girlfriend of mine just about, she was just telling me stories of her coworker. And she was saying that she has several coworkers that they were born in Africa. And then here, their children are first generation Americans. And they would say how their children are just so spoiled and so selfish and so self-centered. And they just don't understand how hard it is. And, you know, I'm sure that's the argument that everyone kind of has about Americans, right? We just don't know how hard it is. But I don't think everyone is like that. <laughs> I definitely don't think every first generation, please, I know many first generation, people from Africa, all over the world in my life, and hard workers. But I just couldn't, I remember just listening to her and I was shocked at how annoyed she was at her parents and frustrated because they ask her to call if she's going to be late and they want to know. And to me, this is a dangerous world that we live in. You live at home. You're a female. Your parents will be concerned about you. You know, even with my own nephew, he lives with us and, you know, it's, you can do whatever you want. I mean, please, you're an adult. He's 23. But we explained to him, if you're out and you're not you know, coming home or coming home really late, give us a heads up. Because what if something were to happen to you? How would we find you? How would we notify the po the police that we need, we are missing? Who would know you're missing if you just don't come home? <laughs> like, how do we know you're missing? And moving forward, now that I'm older, I'm like, ah, oh, I'm just like my parents and grandparents. But I get it now. I totally get it. Um, I understand because then when you get married, that's a concern your wife, your husband will have. You know, if you say, hey, I'm going out for some drinks and then you just don't come home, your significant other is like, yo, are you alive? Where are you? And that's how a lot of problems happen in relationships, Correct? Because a lot of times men men and women, oh, he's always wondering where I'm at or, or um, why is she always calling me while I'm out? And it's like, well, did you even tell her you weren't coming back? <laughs> so it doesn't have to be that dramatic. And so when I'm listening to her, I'm thinking, you know, your parents really love you and they just want you to be alive. And she was saying how if she stays out really late, her dad sleeps on the couch and waits for her. And I'm thinking, you are so lucky. You know, I'm thinking about when I was her age, I would have loved, loved that type of situation where it's, you don't have to eh, go to school. Eh. Oh, you work. Keep all your money. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Like, and you're complaining about cleaning up. That's the least you can do. Very least you can do to help your parents out. I mean, please, they were. And she was saying her parents have full-time jobs. We're not talking about rich parents where they have maids. No, we're talking about, she said her mother and her father both work. And so they want her to clean up. And I'm like, yeah, you work, but you keep your money. And then she said, this was the best part. She said, but it's like they have me clean up stuff that I didn't dirty up, like all their dishes. And I said, well, do your parents only pay for their electricity? Are they like, you know, we're only using air conditioning in this part of the house. So on your part of the house, you'll be all good. No, I know they don't. They're not doing that with electricity, with the roof. <laughs> things being fixed no you have everything that you need and she said that her mom also would go to Costco and like stock up on toiletries okay now I'm done and so it's not so much I mean again she is so sweet I really like her she's so um just nice but it made me just start thinking about man adulting's hard for folks and I start thinking about myself because here I am now, remember last show I said, when you see me again, I will be the mommy of a three-year-old. So yes, my turn, my son has turned three and my husband and I were super like, wow, it's amazing. We have a, a three-year-old and this weekend is his birthday party, you know? And so now it's totally different because the first two birthdays, those parties are really for the parents, you know, parents and the friends, because kids aren't really like mobile completely. 
uh, you know, they're just really young. But then when they get older and older, you start kind of catering the party to the the child. You know, what would the child like to do? How is the child comfortable? And now you have toddlers, you know, so at his older, his other parties, you could have, you know, other things around because toddlers, they, they weren't really toddling and they didn't have height, you know. So some were able to walk, but they couldn't adequately adequately reach stuff on the table. So it's, oh, what are, what are centerpieces going to be, you know, because they might grab it and eat it. Now we're in trouble. So anyway, as we're planning this party, you know, it's really hitting me. I'm like, man, I'm like a legit adult. And I start thinking about back in the day, and I'm embarrassed to say this out loud, but I'm going to say it because it's really true. And me and uh, my best friend, Jen, it was terrible. Uh, we loved being single and free, uh, single in the sense of not married, and we could take vacations, do whatever we want. And I remember when we were in New York, we would ride the train in New York City. And I remember, and I feel like this is so negative now, but I'm going to say it. We actually laughed at people with kids that were our age. Like, yeah, <laughs> that's terrible, right? I know it's terrible, but... Um, I just say this to say, I remember at that point in our life, like in our twenties and we're like, man, we're going to go home and party. <laughs> and we would just see other people and we're like, man, you got to go home and watch your child. And I remember our friends, all of our friends were having children younger and we're just like, why? You know, we were man living the dream. And and over the course of this past week, I met, I met, I had her, she's actually visiting in town and her and her husband had a friend. And so the friend is the husband age. So her husband is just a few, few years older than us. But anyway, so we're, you know, having this lunch and, you know, we got our, our children and the friend is saying how all of his children are older, like as in out of college you know, and I think one of them might be still in college. And I'm like, man, <laughs> thinking I cannot imagine being like this part, this stage of my life and not having kids, you know, because when I thought about it and when I was younger, I think I was kind of fighting that part of adulting in the sense of I just, you know, I felt life was so short and I felt like you could just, it's over in a minute. So I just wanted to do everything that I possibly could do and, and be the most, I guess, selfish and self-centered um, just because I knew that as I got older and as I matured, that is going to have to change and I'm going to have to give the most that I could give. And so when I put myself in this thought process, you know, thinking about why is it so hard to plan for your future, you know? Why is it so hard uh, to accept responsibility? You know, uh, thinking back to the the young girl, you know, even struggles that we have with my nephew, I swear he is so earnest and he can be a hard worker and he is so naturally smart. And it's just some ways, you know, that my, my husband and I were working with him and we call it like adulting, right? <laughs> Our job is when you leave here, you're an adult, you know, no more staying with family. You leave here, you are a legitimate adult and some of the things that we talk about you know could be easy and he just moves on but some of the things are super struggles for him and I, I just question why is it hard so hard and you know what I really think and you may heard this maybe you thought about it maybe you haven't but I really think probably the reason adulting is so very hard is because of a fear of dying I think so. But let me be honest, back in the day um, when I was much younger, I, I didn't feel like I was afraid of dying. I, I was kind of in this free spirit of just seeing death as a transition. I know that sounds crazy as hell, probably. Um, and I guess now as my life became more rooted in love and other humans on earth, <laughs> You know, because with my friends, I'm like, Psh, when we finish Earth, we can meet up on another planet. It's all good. You know, that's how I felt. But then once you start having, you know, family and a child <laughs> and a husband or, you know, you know, in this case, even uh, my nephew is like another child to me, you know, having him here. But 
when that starts happening, you're like, hold up. I can't die right now. <laughs> so, like, uh, 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 I can't die right now. <laughs> so, so that's what I kind of think that when you look at adults, that maybe it signals the end of your life on earth, maybe as you start pe- seeing people age. And that's why possibly so many people are um, injecting their face with things to stop them from aging. You know, I'm not talking about light work. I think dyeing your hair, that's light work. You know, that's light work. Facials, light work. Um and I know some people consider Botox light work. They're like, it's not a facelift, it's light work. That's, I don't know, that could be heavy lifting because some people, oh, they look crazy, right? But obviously all of this has to be one, um, just a fear of dying. That's what I believe, like this fear of getting old and what does that look like? A fear of making decisions means you're now old and what does this mean, you know? But uh, the older that I get is so interesting. I say when you're in your 20s, I remember when I first turned 30, I loved it. And the reason why is because 20, I just had so much insecurity, like consistently. I, you know, even though feeling happy and feeling, you know, good, it was always like more self-doubt, you know? And then when I reached 30, it was great because you could look like you're 20 and still move around, you know, <laughs> you could still move around like you're 20, but you just have more confidence. And, and and one of the things you have more confidence in, at least in my experience, is in what you don't know. Because in your 20s, you have this belief of, oh my God, I'm growing up, I'm getting older, and I don't, I don't know anything, but I should know. I should know, you know, because I'm an adult. I know it, you know. But then when you get to your 30s, you realize, like, no, there's a lot I don't know, but I think you become more confident in the fact that you don't know it, and maybe you want to find out. Shoot, some people are like, I don't know it, and it's all good. I don't want to know it, <laughs> you know. But you get more confident in that. Um. And so now moving beyond that, I'm thinking to myself, wow, um, it's really amazing because you put so much on aging, you know, the number and what it will look like. We put so much on that, that in a lot of ways you miss out on life. You miss out on opportunities to make your dreams come true. And so just taking a step back to the story of the young girl, my main thing to her was to say, hey, I am all about your dreams. I want you to pursue your dreams, but you must plan. You must prepare. Every day that you wait, you waste that day and you don't get that time back. And now it may seem like you have a lot of time because you're thinking I'm 20, but you would be entering New York City and competing with other 20 year olds with you know, by the next year, a college degree doing something that you want to do. And they would have more education and more experience. And so it really needs to be whatever that desire is, balls to the wall. That's what we used to say, balls to the walls. (laughs) But balls to the walls. Try it. Do it. Tomorrow is not promised. We are, all of us, are going to die in the earthly realm, transcend in the spiritual realm. And so why we, while we're here, it really is about conquering our fears, conquering them. And why not, while you're here, try to make each of your dreams come true, as long as they don't hurt somebody. Because some of y'all are wild. So I have to say that, to be clear, but seriously. While you're here, why not? Every day, might as well. What else you got to do? But try to make your dreams come true. Yeah. And you need a plan. People be sleeping on plans, but you need a plan. Okay. So with that being said, I'm going to wrap up in our world and say, do not fear transition. How about that, right? Do not fear transition. Let's all collectively, everybody that listens to this podcast and watches online as well, I want to invite you 
and challenge you to not fear transitions as I am in a major transition, right? So this birthday party, like I said, seems light work. Um, and remember we talked earlier, you could either throw money at a, p- a problem or you can throw energy at it. So when we're talking about this party, I'm throwing more energy at it for the first time. Man, I'm talking decorations, handmade. I'm on YouTube. I'm on all these videos. <laughs> like I want everything like, what'll be a good theme? What can I create myself? Um, I'm also... Don't get me wrong, we're buying a cake. But I'm also making cupcakes. I'm going to specially decorate them, putting my whole heart into this, uh, creating this world <laughs> for our child, you know. It's a it's a party. And so the idea of it is, you know, all of the things that he likes to do. And how can I facilitate that by using, you know, my hands and my heart? I know, adulting. I feel like I'm a legit adult. See, you don't know. You think I'm always an adult. Probably, right? I'm not. (laughs) I'm not always. Definitely this is a transition, but I'm not going to fear it. I'm going to embrace it. So with that, I'd like to thank you so much for joining the show. Again, continue to email me, Danella at DanellaNow.com. And thank you so much for your comments and uh, for following me on social media at Danella Now across all platforms. So next week when I return, we'll talk about how did it go down. Remember I said I made the decorations, but we'll see if they suck. <laughs> I hope not. I'm not very arts and crafts. Like, I wish I could just get a mic and like perform some raps. Yo, yo, kids, line up. Yo. Yo, grab your sippy cups, grab your sippy cups, pull your pull up up, pull your undies up. Boo, that's what the parents would say, right? Boo. Okay, so I hope you have an incredible weekend and I will see you next week.